to another great edition of the Cross Board of Interviews with Chris Brown. I am your host, Chris Brown, and today I am honored and pleased to have our guest on. He is currently crisscrossing Western Canada, running for the leadership of the Maverick Party, and that is Colin Krieger. Colin, thank you so much for doing this. It's an honor and a pleasure to have you on the show. Oh, um, I'm really glad to be here. Thanks for having me on. Uh, so, Colin, uh, I ask, I start all interviews off the exact same way. You are no exception because you're a politician. Where's your sense of duty to serve come from? I have, I am a parent, and I'm just becoming more and more concerned that uh, we need to make some major changes in Western Canada, and if I have the ability to do so, then it is it's my duty to do so. And so I am a, I'm a dad, I'm now a, a grandparent and uh, I want to do it. Um, yeah, it's important to me. Now, uh, before we get into some policy questions, let's learn a little bit more about Colin and who Colin is. <laughs> um, politics is a strange beast to get into. It is a, a unique elephant in itself. Where did politics come from for you? Have you always been interested in politics? Was politics something that was discussed at the family table as a young boy? What, where did politics come from for you? I've always been involved in, not involved, pardon me, interested in politics, just like you said. I've always uh, just thought that it was extremely interesting and important. I followed it avidly uh, ever since I was a teenager. Uh, and uh, I don't come from a long line of politicians or anything like that, but it was always something that I've been really interested in, in doing so. And so uh, how I specifically myself got involved was uh, uh, about a little over a year ago now, uh, a, a good friend of mine who is involved in the Maverick Party in this local area up here in the uh, Peace River Westlock riding, uh, approached me and said, hey, you know, we're looking for candidates to run in the next federal election. And I said, no, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Quite honestly, I told them no. And uh, so I, uh, but just by, they, they swear up and down that they weren't co collaborating or anything. But another good friend of mine, who is also involved in the Maverick Party, called me uh, like within a couple of weeks and said, Colin, you know, I got an email saying that uh, we're looking for candidates for the Maverick Party, and I really think that you should do that. Well, then that that took me back a little bit, and I had to reconsider my position. And uh, at the time, I uh, there was other uh, nominees for the candidacy position, and I thought, well, you know, I I didn't honestly know if I would if I would win the the nomination, but I ended up uh, becoming the candidate, and led to another, and here we are. So what drew you to the Maverick Party? Because before anyone decides to run for a party, you, while your friends can entice you to run, you want to look at their policies and who they are and what they stand for. What aligned with your values when you decided to run in that 2021 election that you said, you know what, the Maverick Party and I, we align on so many issues and I want to run because of that. What were those issues? Well, for me, it's it's the sense that Western Canadians just simply don't have a voice in confederation, in Canadian confederation. We are uh, muted at best, uh, ignored at worst on so many different issues. You know, if, if as if our interests align with Eastern interests, then we will often get it. But um, on so many different things, whether it be energy policy or uh, any of these other types of policies that would uh, unfairly target the West. Uh, you know, and, and that has been something that has bothered me for a really long time. So I, that is primarily the idea. When I heard the Maverick uh, platform being a regional platform and how that that could work in order to give us that clear voice in Ottawa without having to worry about what uh, other parts of the country thought of the things that we need, that really spoke to me. And it made me realize that the, the Maverick message was kind of a, a perfect fit for where I see Western Canadians uh, go in the future. Now, you, you talk about energy policy, and I was going to wait till later on, but let's let's dive into it, because 
the energy is one of the big things that a lot of Western Canadians, particularly here in Alberta, are concerned about. As a man who has worked in the oil and gas sector, who would be leaving a job in the oil and gas sector if you win this uh, race, what are you hearing from the people in the oil and gas sector about what's happening in Ottawa and how unfair they're being treated here in Alberta? Uh, it's the, hypocr the hypocrisy is the part that drives us crazy. On one hand, they, they, they want to uh, talk about this dirty industry that we have. Uh, the oil and gas, you know, is something that's uh, a thing of the past and we're going away from it. But all of the facts say that we're going to continue to need, the world will continue to need oil and gas for the next 40 to 50 years, which is two generations of workers. You know, like we're, we're talking about uh, you know, a way that we can help the world with our clean energy. And yet we're being told that it's dirty and not worth having around. And we are as Westerners denigrated for from, from the East. And yet everything that they use every day is made from petrochemical products. You know, we're like, you know, everybody wants to focus on on the gas you put in your car because that's the cost that comes out of our pocket. But even our iPhones, the steel, you know, everything uses, you know, fossil fuels of some sorts. And so uh, that hypocrisy is what drives us crazy. I, I, I like the word hypocrisy that you use because earlier last week, which as of airing would be this week when we're actually recording this, um, the Liberal government announced a new mining, or sorry, not a new mining, a new oil expansion in Newfoundland and Labrador. That would not be seen here in Alberta because the seats are in Newfoundland who would vote Liberal. Is the Liberal government with Justin Trudeau's Prime Minister pitting East versus West in this anti-oil crusade against the Alberta oil sands? I don't think it's just in regards to that. I think that the divisive nature of the liberal government and their ideology is, is apparent throughout. It's on so many different things, whether it be race or, or even religion sometimes, or, uh, or the oil and gas policies. There's so many different ways that we are being pitted against each other. And this lack of unity is another thing that's a big thing for me. I, as, as a Western Canadian, I want to see all Western Canadians of all cultures, of all uh, ages and working histories uh, to be unified and working together into the future. And I think the Maverick platform is, is one that can accomplish that for Western Canadians. And that's another reason why I love the platform. So you, you're crisscrossing uh, Western Canada right now. You were in BC, if I'm not mistaken, earlier this month. You're you were doing. You are in Alberta a few times. Well, you live in Alberta, so you're here in Alberta a few times. Um, what are you hearing? We we talked about the oil and gas sector uh, sector and the hypocrisy that you're hearing from the workers with the what's going on in Ottawa. But the I don't want to say average day to day person in Western Canada. But what are you hearing from Western Canadians, and what? How can you address it? Uh, frustration. If I had to pick a single word, it's probably frustration, uh, and it can manifest in a lot of different ways. Uh, I I hear it uh, quite often that from people that just say they want to separate. They believe in Western independence. Uh, you see that a lot in Alberta and a lot in Saskatchewan. Um, although not only there, I've heard that also in BC when I was there. They just there's a lot of people that just don't see uh, confederation as something worth fighting for anymore. But that isn't across the board. I see uh, I see also people that just want to see our position inside of our provinces to be strengthened to the point where we can push back federal overreach on a host of different issues. And so the frustration is, is prevalent, 
but how they express it is is different depending on just it, I don't think it's even regional. It's just depending on who you're talking to. Um, even age groups can make a difference with that. I, I was out at the uh, Airdrie AGM that was held here in, I believe it was early, late March, where you and Tariq both gave a speech. I took some photos there and I listened to both of you speak. And I was I was impressed by what you said that uh, on, on this topic of Western separation, Western autonomy, you talked about how you had to get it right. You had to get it right because you had one really good shot of doing it. And right now, as you said, if you talk to people up in, say, rural Alberta, rural Saskatchewan, their opinions are going to be different from what you hear in Edmonton, Calgary, Regina, Saskatoon. So how do you approach a leadership where you have one half saying we're looking at autonomy we're looking at independence where you're saying okay we have to take this cautiously because if we do it wrong we will screw it up for potentially anything in the future of us getting it right exactly and and uh, thank you for that synopsis uh, <laughs> i uh, i don't remember saying it quite that well but it's, you're you're right on the money so just to be absolutely clear, uh, I am not uh, of the opinion where I think that Alberta needs to stay or any of the provinces need to stay. I, I believe that if the Western provinces wanted to become independent, that it would be a good thing. So I need to put that out there first, but this is also true. I don't represent everybody in, in Canada, there are a multitude of different opinions on this particular subject. But what I think that we could all agree on is that the amount of uh, interference from Ottawa in Western Canadian politics is, is obscene. We have to, as provinces, we have to encourage our provincial leaders to start using the powers that they have available to them to start pushing back to halt this um, intrusion into our uh, what are traditionally and and according to law uh, our, our provincial jurisdictions, and so the the Maverick position and mine would be, let's work on those. Um, so inside of all of this, you know, there's a little bit of terminology that you could throw around with it all. One of them would, would be like autonomy. And when I talk autonomy, usually I'm talking about things that would happen inside of confederation, but would strengthen the province's position and give them back the power that they deserve. And when I talk about positions of autonomy, I would talk about things like um, having our own police force. I believe that uh, that we should have uh, every Western province should have their own provincial police force. Um, and it's not that I don't like the RCMP or that I think that they do a bad job. It's just that I think that they are of a split uh, allegiance. They are a federal police force, even though they're paid for the, by the provinces. I think that Western Canadians should be policed by Western Canadians. So that is a layer of autonomy. Another one would be getting rid or stepping away pension plan. That's another thing that I think would be great for Western Canadians. We should be uh, uh, starting our own provincial pension plans and I think it would be much better for our citizens. So those are examples of autonomy that that our provinces frankly do right now. They don't need permission. In fact, other provinces like Quebec already have those types of measures in place and working well for them. I believe that uh, the Western provinces should also uh, bring those things into, you know, into bearing, like they should happen. So uh, now there are other things that are, you know, that are not autonomy issued and are certainly not things that the province can do by themselves. Uh, those things would require constitutional changes, like, um, for instance, the equalization payments system. That has to be changed. 
We pride ourselves on going beyond that 15 second soundbite by becoming a backer of the show. With a quick visit to patreon.com and searching cross-border interviews, you can help continue this show. For as little as $3 a month, your support can ensure we grow and bring new and exciting things to our growing listenership. Click the link in the show notes and back the show today. think you so, could change it though is and i'm not no. trying to play devil's advocate here because <laughs> quebec and ontario will <laughs> will fight tooth and nail to keep that equalization right. payment in place so as much as we mm-hmm. want to go in and change it right. our system is screwing us over where the two largest provinces with the largest populations get the bigger votes <laughs> Correct. And and you're right. And so that's why I want to make the distinction between uh, autonomous things that the provinces can do right now and and then these other things that the West could really use, like getting rid of equalization. Um, But they require constitutional change, which makes them, frankly, difficult to the point of being impossible because of the political will isn't there from the rest of the country. And then we, of course, come to the, the, the separation issue, right, or the independence issue. And that is where, you know, uh, Western Canadians would decide province by province that they wish to have a vote and decide whether or not they are going to remain within confederation or to become independent. At that point, they would have, you know, should that measure pass, should that vote that referendum pass, then they would be in a position of power to negotiate on those other constitutional issues. Because right now, like you said, we don't have we don't have the the power or the negotiating position to really make those things happen, like you like you said. We we talk about uh, Western ideology, Western values, sort of the autonomy that we can do right now. I want to get on the record from you. What are Western values? Because there might be people here listening to this in Eastern Canada, and I know they are not your voting base. So really, why they're listening? Hey, welcome to the show. But uh, this is for a Western audience. What would you say are Western values that Eastern Canadians don't understand our Western values. And, and this, is a, this is a bit of a tricky one because, you know, there are obviously going to be people in other parts of the country. And, we, you know, it's not like we have a patent, uh, a patent on, these, on these values, but they are predominant within Western Canadian culture. In my opinion, uh, uh, having grown up here for my whole life, uh, having raised kids, grandkids, you know, uh, my, my great grandfather uh, homesteaded in this area back in the 1930s. Oh, wow. And this, yeah, right? Like, you know, I'm, uh, those guys knew how to work. You know what? <laughs> I, I don't live terribly far from the old original homestead. And uh, I've, I've tried to, you know, uh, break land uh, without big equipment and it's hard work so i respected all those old guys but that is a part of now i respect farmers of today because (laughs) i wouldn't be able to get up the crack of dawn and do what they do so god bless the canadian farmer as well (laughs) no kidding so but i think it's a cultural thing and this is how i describe it is that uh in other parts of the country they may want to describe culture as as having a common history but here in the West, we, we're not really that old. You know, like Alberta and Saskatchewan became part of Confederation in 1905, you know, and, and so when we have culture here, I think it's more of a common mindset. And I think it's because we have a living memory of a lot of those old pioneering guys. And that's where our hard work ethic comes from. I think that that's where our get or done ethic comes from. I I think that that is where um, honesty and integrity meant something. Uh, And if you you look back at those guys, they were risk takers. We often describe the Western Canadian, uh, one of our idiosyncrasies, 
is that we can be risk takers. But all of those old timing pioneers that came here, they took a risk. They had a common mindset. They didn't know what they were getting themselves into, really. They came all the way over here uh, with just what they could carry, really. And then just had the mindset that if they worked hard enough, if they worked long enough, and that they would be rewarded for it. And by and large, they were. It was not an easy life, but they, they created a good life for themselves. And I think that we still have a uh, kind of a cultural memory of that. And that is a part of our culture. That's what makes us different in the West as opposed to other parts of the country. And uh, I, I think it's worth commenting on and I think it's worth um, thinking about. So that's what I would identify as a Western Canadian set of values. We we talked we talked. Sorry, that was a long the, answer. No, I I, I <laughs> like long answers because it makes the makes an interview great. Um, we talked about the conservatives for a few minutes at the beginning of the interview, but I want to dive into it a little bit deeper because I heard a lot during the last election. I can't. I, I would love to vote for the Maverick Party, but I want to keep Justin Trudeau out. The split voting. I'm assuming you heard it up in Peace River Westlock during your time running there. How do you overcome that going forward? Because you, you're still an upstart party. This will be your second election that you'll be contesting in 2025 if it doesn't get called before then. How do you get Albertans, Saskatchewan's, Manitobians, uh, British Columbians to actually say, you know what, we're going to stick with the Maverick Party this time because I, we just can't continue to vote for the same thing and expect a different result? Funny, yeah, you're right. We, we hear this all the time. And if, for instance, I heard it just the other day, I was in in uh, the Edmonton area getting the oil changed in my pickup truck. As you can imagine, it's been seen quite a few miles and it was time. So I went in there and uh, the young man that, that took my truck into, into the dealership, uh, inputted it into the system, looked at the kilometers, looked at the last time the oil was changed and said, wow, what do you do? You know, and so I, I told him what I was, I'm running for the leadership of Maverick Party and he recognized it. And he said, oh, that's great. I says, I love the Maverick Party. I, I think that that's a, they have a great platform. And I, so I asked him, do you have a membership then? He says, oh, no, I don't think I could get involved until you're bigger, until you have more, you know, you have more members or something. And I, I looked at him and I kind of gave him one of these. And I said, you know, it's kind of a chicken and egg thing you got going on there. Like, uh, you, you know, you have to have people join if you want to get bigger. And he, he laughed and uh, whatever, we, we talked a little bit more about that. But right now, what I've been telling people is forget about splitting the vote. According, you know, because of the, uh, you know, the, the liberal NDP semi-formal coalition, whatever you want to say about it, they've given us a terrible gift. We have time. I'm not asking anybody to vote right now. Of course, there's no vote to be had in the near future. Well, what there's a vote I'm for leadership. <laughs> Oh uh, yeah, well, okay, for me, yeah, of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But I mean, I mean, a federal, a general that, federal election. Agreed. Okay, I just, just wanted to, to throw clear. that right. out there. You that know people what I mean. do need yeah, to buy a membership yeah. to vote for you. Yeah, right, right, right. I don't. Yeah, you need a job. No, I'm teasing. So it's like, good. You're right. So what I said though to him was, I'm not. There's no federal election. Just to be clear, there's no federal election. So I said, if you like the Maverick Party, just join. Join it because you like the platform, I said. And the reason why that's important is because the membership numbers are open. Uh, you know, they're reportable to Ottawa. So if Ottawa sees a growing membership list, they're, they're realizing that things are changing in Western Canada, right? What, what the Conservatives will realize is that uh, we can no longer ignore the Western Canadians. You know, we can't just, you know, count on their votes time after time without, you know, giving them 
any con you know with giving them any attention after the election basically um you know the liberals the liberals will be especially concerned by that because you know the liberals are happy when we vote conservative time after time they have a game plan and they they implement it and it works and they win elections they don't actually care if we vote liberal here in the west so long as we all vote conservative they have a game plan so when people plan Maverick membership we're telling the liberals that we're no longer going to abide by the step we're going to ask for something different we we will not play by the same rules anymore so when i talked to that young man that's what i told him and uh that's why buying a membership is so important. So we have time to grow. In regards to the vote splitting, my goal for every riding is to grow the membership to thousands. My goal would be to have 5,000 members in every riding across Western Canada. If we had 5,000 members, we would probably win the riding. And at that point, Come the next federal election, it won't be the conservatives saying don't split the vote. It'll be us. It'll be saying the Mavericks are the ones who have been working hard. The Maverick Party is the one that wants to properly represent you in Ottawa. The Maverick Party will be the one that gives you that voice that won't be muted, that won't be diluted. And, and don't split the vote because the Mavericks, you know, have done the work for you. And that, that's, my, that's my message right now, really, is because of this, this time that we have been given, if we use it wisely, then we can, uh, we can make a difference. One of the things that I heard during the last election, and it, particularly right after the election, was I wish the Mavericks had a candidate in my riding. I wish that they had ran a candidate every single riding. I know uh, the now interim leader, Jay Hill, said we don't want to split the vote. We're going to run in traditionally safe conservative ridings. I, I'm gonna, I, I asked this to Tariq. I'm going to ask this to, uh, point blank to you, too. If you win, would you guarantee that every Western Canadian has the ability to vote for a Western, a Maverick Party candidate in the next election if they want it to that's the goal now that being said uh we will make sure that every candidate that we have is a quality candidate that's my caveat to that statement uh i'm i won't parachute candidates into writings i won't uh i won't just accept a candidate based on an email uh, I know that has happened in other parties. I won't do it. Uh, we we want to make sure that if that candidate does get elected uh, into the parliament, that he's he or she. Uh, forgive me if I do that. By the way, I don't know why I have this here ticket. It was pointed out to me. I often say he, and it's not that I'm not sensitive, but there's plenty of extremely talented um, lady. Uh, and MPs out there that I would, you know, would be a welcome addition into the Maverick party. So don't, if I say that a lot, please forgive me. Well, I didn't notice it uh, until you pointed it out. So that's how okay. much. Well, so. I noticed myself because <laughs> okay. it was pointed out to me once before. So I, I'm trying to be aware of these things uh, as I speak. So forgive me. But uh, one of the things, and, and there's a reason why I say that we have to be so careful um, one of the things is, is that in regards to that MP, there is uh, the term called backbenchers, right? In, in the House of Commons, there'll be backbenchers. And a backbencher to me is somebody who has the seat that sits in the seat but doesn't control his own vote or her own vote. That is simply another vote that the leader has at their disposal. And that is not right. That, uh, that is not democratic in my point of view and will never happen in the Maverick party. We are not going to have the party whip, if you, wanna, if you know the term. Yeah. Uh, we will not be controlling our 
our MPs votes. Uh, we expect them to vote however their constituents wish, wish them to vote. And so from that point of view, the Maverick Party will never have a backbencher. And so I expect them to be talented. I expect them to be gifted communicators. I expect them to be very good listeners. And I expect them to have uh, uh, wisdom so that when they are in their writings, when they are uh, getting to know their constituents, that when there is a vote in the House of Commons, that they will be able to exercise that vote in a responsible manner on behalf of their constituents. So uh, my goal is, is to have a, uh, an MP or a, or a candidate, I should say a Maverick candidate in every riding, but it will be, um, it will be based on being able to find those candidates and having them properly vetted and so that we are setting ourselves up for success as a party and, and as representatives. So how do you do that? How do you express Western uh, issues when the issues in BC are not going to be the same in Alberta, are not going to be the same in Manitoba, are not going to be the same in Saskatchewan. And even if you want to go locally, the issues here in Calgary are not the same issues up in Peace River, Westlock. So how do you get a party together who have independent minds, but also advocating for the best interest of all Western Canada? Because it seems like a very tricky tightrope you'd have to walk there. It's true. And of course, behind closed doors, uh, the Mad Party Caucus is probably going to have some extremely lively debate, I suspect. We're, we're going to be hashing these things out, trying to make sure that we are um, operating within our, our policies and our guidelines, because that will be the framework that we work out inside of, right? No matter how you vote, it needs to be consistent with the policies and the guidelines of the Maverick Party. Right. No matter, you have to be able to justify your vote based on that because that the platform that you were elected on. So now you're right, it could be tricky because you're, you know, on some things, there's going to be no, no dissent. Everybody wants a balanced budget. We can all vote on that one. I think that, well, yes, we all want a balanced budget. That's, that's something we would agree on. Now, uh, if it was firearms legislation, there would be more debate, I suspect, from an inner city type of a riding to a, a rural riding. And uh, we would talk about a lot of things. On that particular issue, we would talk in regards to firearms issues being more in regards like a property rights thing, instead of actually being about the gun itself it would be more about property rights and we would address it in that manner. So even though there is the potential for having the odd split vote, even within the party, I still think it's worth it because that's democracy. That is how the country is supposed to be run. So you have, I'm just, I'm just cautious of time here. We're about uh, 35 minutes into mm. this interview and I just want to make sure that we get a, a lot in. Uh, I, I should have asked this question before we started talking about policy, but eh, let's do it now because that's the great thing about my show. I get to put the questions wherever I want to. Um, <laughs> you've decided to put your name forward for the leadership of the Maverick Party. If elected on May 14th, you will be the first permanent leader of the party. Why did you do that? Why did you put your name forward? What about you makes you believe you would be the best leader to lead this party into the future? I have a track record of being a good team builder. That is probably one of my strongest skill sets is being able to understand where people are coming from, uh, being able to uh, see different perspectives, making sure that everybody is put in the right spot. And that is going to be, I think, especially at this point in time, crucial 
to the Maverick Party. When we are going from this, um, this stage of, of uh, a brand new party to becoming that next step into a well-organized, hopefully well-oiled machine into the future uh, where we can um, inspire confidence uh, with our electorate that they're not, they don't feel like they're, they're taking a chance, but they're voting for something that they actually believe in. And so my goal, and, and I, I believe I have the skill set needed to do that, to build that team uh, and, and work with the people that are there already and, and bring in new people to, uh, to make sure that when we're ready, when that next election is called, you have a lot of work ahead of you for the next few weeks before the. Um, oh, oh! Did I interrupt you? I'm did sorry. I cut I, out on you? Yeah, you cut out there. So I'll let you continue before I ask my next question. There, sorry. Okay, I, I was just going to say, and, and age might have a little bit to do with it too. I am, like I said before, I'm a grandfather, and I've had some time to develop. Um, a, a, just some of those skills over time. And I think that now is the time where I have enough, uh, it's just the right time of life for me to be able to do this, uh, where I, everything just seems to line up perfectly that I can take on this job and devote my full attention to it. It means leaving the area quite often. You you will have to travel to Manitoba, Saskatchewan. I, I saw via your uh, social media pages that you're going to be in Saskatchewan in a, a few days, um, and you'll be in BC. This is a lot of time away from home. Uh, are you ready to get out there and actually do the hard work? Because I think a lot of party members would be looking at the new leader and saying, if you're just going to stick to Alberta, then I want I want someone who's going to represent all of Western uh, Canada, not just mm -hmm. Alberta and Saskatchewan, where it may be easier to find Maverick voters. Do you think you are up to the challenge to go into Chilliwack, to go into mm -hmm. Dauphin, Manitoba, to find those Maverick Party supporters and speak to the to to disenfranchise conservatives? liberals because you can't just win with the uh, disenfranchised conservatives you have to win with a coalition of people do you think you can do it yeah i frankly without uh, i think i'm working on proving it right now i have been uh working to get out there as much as possible um i, I gotta be fair about this too like i have four kids of, of my own, uh, but they're all grown up and out of the house now, and I'm very proud of them. Uh, they're all making their way. I, I often joke about uh, that which one of them is the black sheep, and I haven't been able to figure it out yet. So they're all good, but I am also a foster parent. Uh, my wife and I, about six years ago, decided that we would get involved in, in the foster parent program, and uh, we have three awesome uh, siblings in our care right now and they've been in our care now for three and a half years and they will remain in our care um, probably until they're all adults it's not common within the foster care system but it's the way that this is going so i actually had to talk with the foster care system prior to me accepting this uh this leadership bid because uh, i can't i can't sacrifice my home my my kids or anything here for this uh, you know there are priorities but we have looked after them i can do it uh my wife and and my kids supporting my wife my adult kids supporting my wife which are great uh makes this a lot easier for me they they soak up the balance while i'm gone i will be traveling a lot since the middle of, oh shoot, I got to remember, it'd be probably March. I've put on about 12,000 kilometers since then, since the middle of March already. I've done many, many trips up and down the length of Alberta, stopping in numerous ridings. Uh, we went one trip, as you had mentioned before, where we went up through the north part of British Columbia and then went down the center and ended up all the way down in the Soyuz. 
uh, and back up across to Crow's Nest. And then here in Alberta, we are planning another trip into uh, Saskatchewan here shortly, as you said. I plan on doing this until the next election, if necessary. Now, the good news about today's technology is that, as you and I are doing, we're, you know, we're six or eight hours of driving apart, and yet we still can talk face to face. And so we will be using this type of technology as well to make sure that we are keeping in touch with all of our our uh, people that we need to uh, doing meetings as as often and uh, you know as 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 necessary. And so. Uh, Although I got to be honest, I prefer face to face. If I have to drive six or eight hours to do a face to face meeting, I'd rather do it. But uh, I just you think and there's me value both, Matt. to that. You and me both. I miss the in person. Which is next time we do this, can we say that? That next time we'll just all come and see you. Yes, we will. I, hey, I, I, from what I understand, the Maverick Party is holding a leadership debate here in Airdrie at the end of the month, if mm -hmm. I'm not mistaken, the 28th. Or the 27th? 7th, I think. So, yeah. hey, if you're, if you're listening to this, which this episode comes out on the 27th of April, if you're listening to this on the 27th <laughs> of April, head out to Airdrie, I think it's the golf course, if I'm not mistaken, and attend the right. debate. The links will be in the show notes. So hypothetically, go out, listen to both Tariq and Colin. <laughs> I'm assuming you'll both be there in person. Yes, sir. So go out and meet Colin and Tariq, both leadership candidates. <laughs> um, my last question for you is this, because I guarantee you someone up in Slave Lake who probably listens to this show more than I listen to my own show uh, is yelling at their car radio right now, driving from Slave Lake to High Prairie because they usually send me a message saying, why didn't you ask this question? Or someone driving from Saskatoon to Regina or somewhere in Western Canada wants to reach out to you and ask a question that we didn't cover in this last 45 minutes. Where would they do that? How would they get in touch with you? Uh, well, there's a couple of different ways. You can, uh, the best way is to, on Facebook, go to uh, my Colin Krieger Maverick Party page. You can do so there. Uh, I have a website, which is www.colincrieger.ca, pretty easy. Uh, my my uh, email address is similar, just info at callingfigure.ca. And uh, you can try any of those things. I'm also on Twitter. Uh, Krieger Colin, I think, is my Twitter handle. Pretty pretty easy. So I, I try and make myself uh, available to everybody. And here's one that maybe it's on my card. So I'm going to share it here, too. If you want to call me, you can. 780-524-8807. Send me a text. And yeah, 524-8807. For those who have listened to the show before or followed along uh, while watching this, the links to Colin's information are in the show notes. So if you're watching this on YouTube, scroll down. The information's there. If you're listening to this on your car or radio, pull over. Then you can check the information. <laughs> Please. Do not text and drive. <laughs> as much as we all want to try and do it, don't. I had someone die from a uh, distracted driver, so please don't. Um, Mm. Colin, my last question to you this is, because I said that was the last question, but this is the actual last question. What? Uh, well, actually, I'll ask this question. I'll, I was going to ask a different question, but I'm going to ask this question instead. Oh. You no. are... <laughs> no, no, just no, just no. <laughs> Why Here's should people COVID. join the Maverick Party of... Why, why should not people join the Maverick Party and support you? I think that we can take this to the next level. I think that we can take the Maverick Party and we can get to the place where we can be proud of our leaders. Integrity means stuff. Integrity means everything actually. Uh, I have a hard time with that one because I know that I, I know that I will do a good job. But nobody can ever say that I own integrity. 
right? Nobody can never say I'm an honest guy because you can't own that. You have to prove it over time. But we can do that. I guess that's one of the things that I want to, um, one of my points that I want to bring into the Maverick Party, and, and this would probably be one of the more um, bigger differences between Tarek and, and myself, is I want to try and bring recall into, into the Maverick Party. Uh, being able to recall our MPs even in the middle of an election cycle. And that is because of a question that was brought to me during the election. I had this one, you talk about High Prairie, there was this one cowboy, this little old cowboy that asked me, <laughs> he said, uh, I like what you say, but you better not disappoint me. You know, and he was speaking to that issue of, of integrity. He says, you're not the only, you're not the first guy that's ever come through here and, and made these claims. Like, and it speaks to integrity. And so what I had to tell him is, is uh, unfortunately nobody can claim it. But now we have the ability to maybe go one step further. And that's what recall will be able to do. Uh, if the constituent doesn't like what their Maverick member of parliament is doing, we want to give them the ability to get him out of there. The problem with most recall is that it takes often more votes to get them like out of power than it did to actually put them in power. It's, it's difficult to do. And so I want to make it different. And how it's going to be different is it will be internal at first. So if 2,500 Maverick members in a riding, they all have to reside in that riding, get together and sign a petition of recall, it will trigger an internal nomination race within the Maverick party uh, for, that, for that MP's seat. He will have to justify to his electorate why he belongs there. Now, should he lose that? Should he lose that? that nomination race, according to a contract that he would have had to have signed that will put penalties in place if he doesn't do them, he will have to step back and vacate that seat and that will trigger a by-election. The guy who won the nomination race will then step forward on behalf of the Maverick Party and will run in the by-election for that seat. I think he would probably win it because the Maverick Party will be the only ones that will offer this ability uh, to not just say that we have integrity, but will back it up with teeth. And it's an assurance to all of our voters that uh, we're not just there to get a pension. We're not just there to, uh, you know, do you know whatever I don't know but I think in order to be a perfect uh, not a perfect but to be a good representative you need to be out on your riding when was the last time that we saw our members of parliament out in their riding on a regular basis uh, no I don't I, I don't mean to call anybody out but I, it doesn't I, seem I, to I happen will. very often I will. I've lived in Calgary for two and a half years. I've not seen one member of parliament or one MLA at my door, unless it was an election. Two, when I lived up in Slave Lake for five years, Foster, Alberta, I yet again, yeah. former liberal candidate up there, I never saw Honor Arnold Vierson. Yeah, and we that that shouldn't be. I want I want the Maverick MP to be accountable is electorate. You know, yes, you know, an, an MP is in Ottawa like six months of the year. That That's true from what I understand. That's kind of the number. But when they're home, that doesn't mean that they don't have to be out. They should be doing scheduled meetings, I think. Even if it's just in a coffee shop, I'm going to be in this coffee shop from this hour to this hour. Come and sit down at the table with me so that I can know how you feel, so that I know how to vote when I get to the House of Commons. What do you, what are the issues that I should be bringing up for you? You know, 
Email is great. We all use that at will, but there is no suit for, for being a, able to be out and about in our writings. And so that is why I know some people are kind of concerned in regards to that. They think that there is a potential for chaos. Um, holds people to account. Yeah, it holds people to account. And I think that if our members of parliament, the Maverick members of parliament know their job, they're not going to have a problem with that. We we'll never have to exercise this ever because our guys will just know what to do. I want, I want our constituents to smile when they say our names. Yeah. So well, that's my, that's my, that's, that's your what pitch. I want to see. Well, Colin, <laughs> I want to thank you so much for sitting down for the last 55 minutes now and chatting about your leadership views and where you want to take the Maverick party and your policies. Um, conversations like this need to happen more often. Uh, I think people get stuck behind social media and it's the wrong place to have a discussion, to be honest. I think you're right. Go to the, your local A&W. Because I, I remember going to my local A&W in Slave Lake and I can tell you, if you were getting the news from the day, you were getting that local A&W because that's where all the guys were and they were chatting about what was happening in the community. So I, I say this over and over again. But get out there and have a conversation, people. It, it, I know it may seem challenging for some, but it does help our democracy and it helps us be a better society. Um, but Colin, thank you so much for doing this. It's been an honor and a pleasure. Yes. Did you hear? Did you hear any of that? Probably not. Eh? Uh, you cut out. You cut out a little oh, bit. Sorry. No, I, I said thank you so much for doing this. This has been an honor and a pleasure. Oh. Uh, it's been my honor, and I, I appreciate every minute of it. Thank you for uh, thank you for being so patient. I know it's been a little while in the in the preparation of making this happen. So thanks. We for got your to patience sit down. Well. That's all that matters. So with that, I want to thank everyone for tuning in for another great edition. We'll be back tomorrow for another great episode of the Crossboard Interviews with Chris Brown. Have yourself an excellent day, and remember, guys, just keep talking.